Welcome to the Dork Forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the Dork Forest and dork out for a and welcome to the Dork Forest. I'm Jackie Cation. You know the websites, JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com. If you like a determiner, FamilyPetAncestry.com, which I just renewed because it's funny. Let's do the credits. You just heard the song that Mike Rickberg composed and sang with his wife, Sarah Cohen. He will sing his words to the Mexican hat dance at the end of the program. Patrick Brady's going to fix this audio and Vilmos does JackieCation.com, the website. DorkForest.com has available essentially player notes and the YouTube version of the show. You can listen to the show on iTunes and Stitcher and all the things, but you can also listen to it on YouTube or on dorkforest.com. JackieCation.com has all my stand-up comedy information and the merch for Dork Forest. You can get t-shirts, you can get CDs, you uh, can get pins that say Spooky Reading Girl or Meat Shield, but they are not available on the website. You have to email me, Jackie at JackieCation.com. There's also the calendar of my stand-up comedy to find out where I'm playing near you. If I'm not playing near you, talk to your local comedy club and request me. What the heck? There are also videos of my stand-up. You can watch my Conan. You can watch clips from my DVD and links to my other podcast, The Jackie and Lori Show on Nerdist, which is just about stand-up comedy. Anyway, there is also a donation button on both JackieCation.com and DorkForest.com. It's a PayPal button. Uh, all it is is a way to donate to support the show. You can do that by using the Amazon banner, which is just a link to get you to Amazon, which uh, supports the show. You just order like normal. It doesn't cost you extra. And you can use the donation button just to donate. If you don't like PayPal, you can Venmo me, Jackie at JackieCation.com. There is also uh, premium episodes at thedorkforest.bandcamp.com. And those cost $2 a piece because they're live episodes and they cost me some money to put up. So if you've run through all the episodes, you can go to Bandcamp and get like 10 more. What the heck? So much info. I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Thanks for supporting the show. Let's get into it. Hey, it's Jackie Cation, and I'm in my living room with Mark Wade. Uh, I'm very, uh, when when we met, it was murder. No, but it was great. <laughs> and we were on that yeah. podcast with J. Keith Van Stratton's. That was a good time, actually. Yeah, it was really yeah. fun. And it was, I was supposed to, I was told I w- asked what I knew about. Right. And then I did not have a depth of knowledge of comic <laughs> books that I thought I had. Right. Um, uh, it turns out I was just looking at a list and I was like, oh no, I've read almost, I think I've read all of your Marvel, except okay. for the Fantastic Four. Okay. And Irredeemable yeah. and Incorruptible okay. uh, blew my mind. Thank you. So that's an exciting thing for me. But you enjoy Superman, so we were going to talk about Superman. Happy to talk about Superman. Anytime, anywhere. Anytime, anywhere. And I'm I'm rereading Birthright, which is also exciting for me. Thank you. So, uh, that's, my, that's my favorite thing I ever wrote. Thank you. Is it? 2,000 comic books. That's my favorite thing I ever wrote. Oh, wow. And it's really good. Thank you. Because I, I do love Superman. Well, you know what it is? You can always tell, and you know this from being a creative person, you can always tell when somebody's passionate about something. It's a, years, years oh, ago. Oh, from the product? Yeah. When, yeah. Years and years ago, I was, I was an editor at DC Comics, and uh, I was editing some book that I didn't, I know, like objectively was not good. It was okay. objectively not a good book. Right. But I still kind of enjoyed reading it, and I couldn't figure out why, and I asked my boss, and he said, well, it's because the guy who wrote it would write it for free. Right. And it shows. Yeah. And you can't fake that X factor. You can't fake that enthusiasm. And that was the X factor that made it readable to me. So Okay. And I went X Factor and I was like, was it Peter David? It wasn't Peter David. But it was DC. Yes. So of course it was not. And uh my, my see my knowledge of uh, a little inside baseball for you there. It people. was beautiful. I love uh and, and I think yeah, and I think you're right about the the passion is that sure. you can tell or in stand up anyway, as I could tell, I'm like, Oh, they love this so much. Yeah. They aren't great at it, but maybe they will be because uh, everything – it turns out you start doing things because you don't know how to do them. Right. And then you keep doing them and you – that's how you learn. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it'll be fine. <laughs> anyway, so Superman. Yeah. You've also written Batman. I've also written Batman. And, um, and, and Justice League. And Wonder Woman and Green Lantern and Flash and the Fantastic Four and Captain America and the X-Men and Archie Comics and right. every, oh, everything. You, absolutely everything. Yes. It's a, it's, and the Princess Leia uh, yes. run that I loved, Thank you. actually. So, but the, um, what is it, 
what is it that makes Superman your favorite? A, a question you've been asked a thousand times. I will Please tell you. I will tell, tell you my story. Again. I will tell you my story. Please. So growing up, I love comic books as. Most kids, if I really loved, I got into the Batman TV show, the Adam West Batman TV show, and so okay. I loved comics. And but I loved a lot of other things too. I loved magic tricks, and I loved broadcasting, and I loved like there was a bunch of stuff that I loved when I was passionate. When I was a kid. Comics was a big part of it. I wasn't particularly a Superman fan. I did not like Superman. Oh, did you watch the Superman TV? Uh, I didn't actually because we live in the Deep South, okay. where there was no syndication. There was one syndicated channel, so right? Was, so I never saw the Superman TV show until I was a young adult, which is okay. very strange. So, um, but so we're talking like the, the late seventies, and I grew up, and I don't want to, I don't want to overcharacterize this as tragedy. It's not that. It's just that I grew up in a very complicated household. I grew up in a very sure. complicated where it was. It wasn't. That sounds like a mess. Yeah, it wouldn't. You know, it wasn't. It, it, long story short, I just didn't feel like anybody really cared whether I was alive or dead. I mean, really right. didn't get that sense. That's not fair <laughs> looking back to the people who were. But And no one's a villain in this, but I'm just saying. Everybody always does the best they can. Everybody does the but best they can. But you were a child. But they, And I was not – I did not feel cared for. I did not feel wanted. I did not feel appreciated. Um, and on January 26, 1979, I went in to see Superman the movie, Christopher Reeve. Right. And I saw it twice in a row, sat there twice in a row. And I went to that theater liking Superman. I came out of that theater knowing that whatever I was going to do with the rest of my life, it was going to have to have something to do with Superman. <laughs> that is real. That's a cool story. It, it, that was my origin. That's my secret origin. It that's just, your that se- became that, – that's when I realized, oh, my God, that I found – everybody gets to pick their own religion, right? Everybody gets right. to choose their own religion. And I, and I knew that – even then, I mean, I know he's a fictional character. He's not right. real. I understand that. I'm not right. crazy. But that said, I, and it took me a while to process this. And it took me until I was an adult to process this. But what happened was I went in there thinking nobody cared about me. Right. And I, but Superman cares about everybody. Right. He cares about everybody, no matter who you are. Mm-hmm. And the, that just reached out to me at a very crucial time of my life and touched me at a very important point when I was, you know, mid-teenager. Right. And made all the difference. And so that's – ever since then, it's been Superman all the way. I ride or die. That is uh, kind of fascinating because I remember seeing Superman at the same time. Mm-hmm. I, I think we're probably age, age, uh, same age. And it blew my mind because one of the – I mean I read a lot of fiction. Mm-hmm. And I was always looking sort of for – Sort of a definition yeah. of bravery or yeah. a definition of standing up for what was right. Yeah. And and one of my favorite definitions was always uh, d- to do something even though you're scared to do it. Sure. Yeah. To do the right thing even though you're scared. Right. And I felt I – f- um, I never got the impression – that super, I mean, because some of the criticisms of Superman is that he's so powerful. Right. Then you can't do anything with him. You can't hurt him. He's boring. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. You've heard yeah. it, I'm uh, sure. A million times. A million times. But I never got the impression that he didn't have flaws or a fear or uh, that he wasn't a person. Of course he was a person. Exactly. Yeah. This is just, he's, this nonsense of, well, he's so strong, you can't do anything with him. He's dull. That's, that's his crap. Look, here's the thing. Yeah, that's true. It takes kryptonite to hurt him or whatever. It's, it's, right. It's, but still, he's a human being. He care. He's very vulnerable inside. He cares about everybody. He really the ever the the fate of everyone in the world. The whole you know the he, the way he feels about everybody. He looks out for everyone as a guardian angel. Therefore, any anybody anything that is a hurt to the human race is a hurt to him. Right. Yeah. Which is why irredeemable yeah. was so interesting. Thank you. Because. He can hear everything. Yeah. He can he can hear every slight. He can hear every insecure other person on the planet yeah. slam him. And eventually the Chinese water torture that that is yep. makes the character an irredeemable snap. Exactly. That was and, pretty much my answer to what if Superman grew up with Ayn Randian parents. You know, Ayn, right. Ayn Randian parents. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Like he did in the movies. But um, – but what if you grew up? You know, not everybody is emotionally equipped to be a superhero, right? So right. That, that was what it, that was my answer. He's Superman's origin, basically, but this super powerful character with you know all this might and so forth. Suddenly, he realizes that he he just wants to be loved to a point where it's it makes him unstable. Right. Right. It's and it's interesting because no, I'm, I'm always curious. No, I've not always been curious about it. I'm just now curious. Yes. Is it nature or nurture that makes a superhero? That's a very good question. Yeah. 
I tend to think it's nurture as much as anything else. I think right. I, would, I would tend to balance it toward nurture versus nature. Right, because um, did you see the Deadpool 2? Yeah. Uh, I have the DVD, and the, in one of the extras, he goes back to kill baby Hitler. Yep. And, uh, and so... Well played, Deadpool. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And he's just holding him yeah. at the end of it. And it's... Uh, spoiler alert. You're not going to miss him. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Um, so... Because you don't want to watch him kill a baby anyway. No. So... Uh, but the... Uh, um, but so I do, th- yeah, I do think it's it's nurture because I read Red Sun, yeah, which is him being raised in the Soviet Union, right, with a, just a different ideology. Yeah. His, his parents weren't evil, right? He wasn't a bad guy. Right. He he was just had a different indoctrination. Yeah. So, uh, here's my uh, my other question: Is the Batman TV show? Right. This has been this, uh, and I forget it might have been my friend Dash who the best definition of Batman's. Batman the TV show is one of my favorite Batman. Sure. Because his superpower seemed to be that he was the only adult. Yes. That's just it. He was the only <laughs> grump. The police looked at him like he ran the police. The yeah. Kind of, um, he was like, well, that isn't okay. Which is, Let's get our suits on. Which is really paradoxical because if you look at the reason that so, – so, you know, Adam West is about that time like 35 or so. And Burt War is – like 25 playing 16. Oh, right. But how they do this, if you look closely, how they make these characters look even younger yeah. is that the, everyone else in the cast came over on the Mayflower, right? Oh, right. <laughs> You're right. Every, Everybody is super everyone's old. Everyone's super old on that show except for Robin and, and Batman. So that's so. <laughs> that's how you make a 35-year-old look 25. And yet, there you go. He, and, but you're right. He's the adult in the room. Yeah, he's – and you're right. He's, that seems to be his real superpower. Yeah, that, as, and, that and earnestness. I would say his superpower is earnestness. He's also very earnest. Yes. Um, I think that what it was – because the one criticism I've heard about Batman yeah. is that – and it made me laugh, but it, I – what do you – is that – Batman could fix a lot of the problems in Gotham if he would open like three factories yeah. and employ a bunch <laughs> of people. Employ people, yeah. Yeah, because and um, but he wants to buy batarangs. Yes, and, yeah. and it's his money. It's his money, and it's a more expedient way of doing things. I understand. Yeah, you get it. Yeah, it's okay. So, um, so did and and then so that talk. So, what else do you want to talk? Tell me about Superman. That so there's. There's questions I have, but they're but I feel like they've been asked of you. I but so, c- cue me, set me up. Cue set, me. Oh, there okay, we go. go. Just yeah. it's T-ball. Yeah. So uh, the origin yeah. of Superman. Right. That once you saw the 1979 movie, yeah. you had to go back and go, where did Superman come from? Yeah. How do I how do I make this part of my life? Right. And what was that? What did you do there? I mean, did you go and? Read Cavalier and Clay or whatever. <laughs> no, that's a good question. Actually, I mean, I just I absorbed everything. I mean, at that point, I was already a living encyclopedia of comic book novels, oh, and so enough. and I just continued to be that. It was Moses. I couldn't. There was nothing about Superman, whether you know his fictional character or his creators, that I wouldn't read about, that I wouldn't absorb, that I wouldn't pay attention to. Um, and it just became again, it just became a fixture in my life. It's you know like. Every, again, everybody used to pick their own religion. Okay. And so the people who wrote the intro to Birthright yeah. were Smallville yeah. um, folk. So yeah. you watched – have you watched every, every iteration? I have read every Superman story ever published. Okay. I have seen every show. I have listened to every radio broadcast. I have, there's, there's no one else on earth who has exposed himself <laughs> to as much Superman material as I have. There's not a single Superman story that I'm aware of okay. that I have not that you, read or listened to or watched or whatever. Or seen in some way, uh-huh. shape, or form. Okay. So the first Supermans – were 1939, right? right 38, 38. 38? Yeah. Okay. And um, were th- who, who wrote it? Uh, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Joe, Jerry Siegel was the writer. Joe Schuster was the artist. Okay. The two 17-year-old boys from Cleveland who came up with this, this larger-than-life figure okay. in, like, 1933 and wanted to make a comic strip out of it. Yeah. And had this brilliant idea, and they sent it out to every comic strip syndicate in America, and everybody turned it down. Absolutely, everyone. Every, everyone flat, flat out. Just this is ridiculous. No one would believe this. This is too off the charts. Even though he was an alien. Even though he was an alien, because again, science fiction was not really a part of our vernacular oh, in nineteen thirty three, nineteen thirty four. It was you know, I'm not even sure the, the phrase had been. I'm not sure who uh, Gernsback had. And it certainly with. wasn't anything that was mass produced no, exactly. at all. Ever. Exactly. Okay. Well, so and, and that and and really even the the. The visual manifestations of, of Superman were 
not something that we would be used to. Like the idea that the first time we see Superman, he's lifting a car over his head right. and pounding it into a cliff. And the publisher took one look at that cover yep. and said, that is ridiculous. Don't put Superman on the cover anymore. Uh, <laughs> and so Action Comics covered the next bunch of Action Comics covers were a bunch of like soldiers for hire and you know oh my racketeers God. and stuff. And eventually they did research and they realized that the kids were asking for the comic book with Superman in it. So they thought, well, let's put him on another cover. Okay. And they left him off another couple of issues. But th- this idea that it was just it was so ridiculous a concept that yeah. the publisher said no one will want to see this. Is insanely short sighted. Right, right, yeah. and and weirdly, and and their idea was just that it was it was too much. It too was much too larger. ridiculous. Exactly. Yeah. It was like this is what children would write. Right. Yes. And it was what children what would children write. They were writing. Yes. Exactly. They came up with it when they were seventeen years old. They were kids. Yeah. Yes. And but they obviously struck a nerve, and yeah. so went. So they didn't publish till thirty eight. Right. Finally, it was through the slush pile. Comic books had not been created yet, and or barely been created in nineteen thirty three when the when these guys came up with this, so they were looking at a newspaper strip. Is what they okay. wanted. Okay. Oh. Um, Mark Trail. Exactly. And they <laughs> circulated and circulated. And nobody wanted it, and finally, it ended up in the slush pile of a company called National Periodicals that was okay. starting to uh, eventually became National Periodicals, Detective Comics. Uh, that event, that slush pile, and they were looking to create a brand new comic book because they realized they'd done a couple of these comic books before. Um, Which – did they think of them as just compiling strips? That's all they were for the first like two or three, four years of comics existence. They were just newspaper strips compiled them into magazine form. Okay. And it wasn't until like – And ma- it was relatively popular. Really? So they were like, oh, So eventually somebody said, well, this? you know, we kind of – it was pretty much the idea that by the time National got around to wanting to do their own comics, the licenses for all the major newspaper strips had already been scooped up. So uh, really, what choice do we have but to do our own original stuff right. and put it in comics? And that took off. And so when they wanted to put together a brand new uh, comic called Action Comics, a big you know anthology book, they were looking through the slush pile and looking for stuff to put in it. And lo and behold, there's the Superman thing. Let's give this a whirl and see if anybody cares. What was the first story? I, I've never read Action Comics number one. or And that's what that would have been, yeah, right? It would it, have been. Okay. It's great. He is... He is <laughs> He is just a, a take no prisoners, you know, a, a liberal hero. He's just <laughs> he's a social justice warrior. Okay, um, by definition, I yeah, guess, yeah. I mean, when in that first story, he's doing stuff like he he, he came across a wife beater and just threw him through a wall. He, he oh, there he, you go. He finds a bunch of everything. It's a lot of little adventures. It's not, I can't tell you like the big story because it's really just sort of episode, episode, episode. But right. it's just. A few pages of Superman dealing with a wife beater. A few pages of Superman dealing with a, a guy who is going to the chair for reasons that you know he's been framed, and so he's ah. stuff like that. Okay, but so the, he's just correcting errors. He's correcting errors, but he's and he's doing it in sort of a brute fashion, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and for the first year or so of that whole strip, there were no super villains. There were no. There was no kryptonite. There wasn't anything like that. So Superman's adventures were basically social justice things. Like here's a, here's an adventure about. A bunch of orphans who are being, uh, you know, uh, abused by an orphanage. Right. So let's do something about that. Here's a story about a coal miner who, or a coal, a coal baron, yep. whose coal mine is, you know, unsafe. Uh, unsafe and, and so let's go teach him a lesson. It right. was all um, there okay. is. Okay. Yeah, the very first Superman Sunday because he went to, to the. He finally did do the newspaper strips and he finally went to the Sunday strips and the very first Superman Sunday. I love this. I love this. <laughs> is Superman li- comes into an evil banker's office. A crooked banker's office. Right. Lifts up a safe and says, and I quote, and this is absolutely true, he says, nice place you got here. Be a shame if anything happened to it. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that is, is about Superman. as far away from Christopher Reeve as you can get. And yet there's something so electrically fascinating about that character. It's, it, a, it's sort of this, but in some ways it's the same guy. Oh, yeah. Because, uh, yes, Christopher Reeves was very much a sort of a gentle powerful he, he giant yeah, he didn't have of a, a temper like the like the original superman did right exactly. he wasn't yeah he wasn't you could make a case that the original superman was a bully but he was a bully to the right people right right and and essentially corrected what was in front of him sure. like didn't try to like if there were no supervillains right. and you had a superpower yeah you would fix the thing in front of that's you. what you would do exactly right yeah. you were like why why did you do like in birthright yeah when there's a kid shooting up the high school right 
he goes and finds where they bought the guns. Yes. And he nails that guy to the wall with a bunch of guns. Yes. <laughs> He's exactly. like, yes. Yes. Yeah. That's that. That's the same story. Yes. That, that's a, a great slice. Of, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So that so the the first couple issues are just regular crimes right, or first, regular injustices for the first like year or so of the of those because it, it ran in action comics every month and then Superman comics was their second they really we had Superman so popular we're going to give him his own comic books they did mm-hmm. and so he's now he's appearing in two books a month uh, or, two, or, or several or two books at once rather um, and uh, so you, the problem with doing these social injustice stories is that you're burning through them pretty quickly right and there's a point about a year and a half in where Superman decides that there are too many unsafe cars on the streets of Metropolis. So he puts all of the car dealers on notice and says, I'm taking all the unsafe cars off the street, just let you know. And he goes and destroys a car lot because they're selling lemons. Then he goes to a car manufacturer that's, that's deliberately selling uh, sub, right? substandard cars and destroys the factory. I think maybe you're punching down at this point. Right, right. At this I think point. Maybe you're punching down. You could, you could, yeah. So, Take a break and, right. and look for a topic. So eventually, the, you know, Siegel and Schuster realized what well, we kind of run out of social issues. It's time to maybe bring some supervillains into the mix and bring okay. something that, you know. A genuine bad genuine guy. Genuine bad guys or genuine menaces that can hurt Superman. Right. So, and then it sort of, and that sort of grew. But the first couple of years, like I said, is just straight up social justice stuff. And how long did they write for? Because they, they were young. They were young. What happened was, this is a fairly famous story. I mean, they sold, Siegel and Schuster sold Superman to what became DC Comics for 130 bucks. That Yikes. was it. Well, and, and 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 some you never know and some royalties and stuff and you, sure. and, and you never and, but you never know right well of course you know it turned out to be this incredibly you know. right so in the late forties they sued oh DC they were Com- like come on yeah now <laughs> I I want that suit to be called that come I mean, on come on yeah <laughs> and I can you know I can make a good case for that suit I can you know they it is not fair to think that they were so miserably treated that they were wearing barrels right. and you know and and you know eating off the street i mean they were they were millionaires okay um they could afford lawyers they could well yeah <laughs> unfortunately they afford they 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 afforded a really awful one it's a guy that Siegel met in the sh- in the in the service oh. and, and he was like military grade awful as oh a lawyer oh my god <laughs> uh Charged them out the wazoo. They sued DC Comics. They lost painfully. Yeah. And they made a few bucks. Yeah. But they were then ostracized off Superman. Then they were just told, you no more work from DC Comics. We're taking your name off the strip. Yeah. And you're nobody. And so that's the... so. And I'd never heard of them. Right. So. Schuster never went back to work in a DC. Siegel finally... In the mid sixty, early sixties, went back to DC, sort of hat in hand, right, and begged for his job back. He was always sort of he was the he was, and I'm not kidding. He's the, he was Clark Kent. He was very much the nebbishy, okay, in real life. He was the, mild mannered, mild mannered, <laughs> right, be, be spectacled, meek, timid guy. Yeah, and so he went hat in hand and begged for a job, and he worked for DC Comics for another, you know, six seven years, right, and then copyright renewal came up, and so he sued again for. Super, and he lost again, and therefore, and he was put out on the street again. Right. So, so, uh, who started writing it when they left, or when they? A bunch of different guys. I mean, it was yeah. there were yeah. It was at first. It was Siegel, and it, we're supposed to believe it was just Siegel, but I've seen evidence that it's like his brother-in-law is doing some stories, and okay. his cousin's doing some stories and stuff. That's fine. So, um, right, we but, all get stories from our loved ones. Exactly. Are you kidding me? But after that, it just became, people have great stories. After that, it just became an, like an open rotation of whoever freelancers felt like doing something. Right. So, what what are your favorite early ones that are not from them? Not from are there. Them. There's, I mean, there's a there's a few, but there's there is a magic that is lost once they are gone. Okay. Um, that has to be recon. I mean, yeah. Because yeah. you're, now you're working with people who aren't in love with. Because get back to what we were saying before, you're not in love with it, right? Uh-huh. You're not. Um, it's a job, and there's some good Superman stories there, but what really gave Superman a shot in the arm yeah came about 1958 uh, there was this editor named Mort Weisinger he was a staff editor okay he was by every account a complete asshole okay like, like, there is no one in all of comics history who ever worked with him who ever had a kind thing to say about Mort and this is the thing we know about Mort <laughs> what we know is that Mort was an asshole I, 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 I talked to his kids his kid actually his son rang me up angry one day because yeah. I had written something in a, in a magazine about how Mort was universally Known to reviled. Be a jackass. And, yes. you know, how dad you say that about my dad? And he's so in, within five minutes as we're talking about his dad, he's right. telling me stories that would make your hair turn white about <laughs> things he did to his son <laughs> right. and his daughter that right. were complete 
indefensible asshole. asshole. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, but he had a vision. He yeah. knew to hire the right people. He knew to hire the right artists and the right writers. And with, under his tutelage, under his, or under his, uh, you know, on his watch, in about 1957, 1958, he took over the Superman books creatively, and went to the. He had his stable of writers. There were Edmund Hamilton, who was a big science fiction writer, of okay. the 30s and 40s, uh, and and a bunch of other Otto Bender, who had been doing a lot of comics over the years. He'd written Captain Marvel forever, and he was he was against the, you're getting the best guys in comics. You're getting the yeah. best guys who were still writing comics, and M- Mort had a rule, which is we're going to. Expand the mythos. We're going to like give him all kind of new villains and all kind of new places and all kind of new locales. But the idea is every six months we want something new. Okay. Whether it's a different kind of kryptonite or it's something else from Krypton that we didn't know about or some other relative that we never met or whatever. <laughs> Just something. And Invent so, something. Right. And so that's the silver. It's called the Silver Age of DC Comics, the Silver Age of, of Superman from 1958 to about 1966 or so where it was just every few months – Something new to broaden that whole mythos so then it becomes like a, a big, giant continuity of really cool stuff. Okay. So um, the original guys invented kryptonite. And yes. did they introduce – Actually, they did not. They did not. Actually, the kryptonite was actually – well, I can make a case either way. Okay. Here's what happened. You asked. Yeah. So I'm going to no, tell no, you. No, please. Okay. It might be <laughs> good – Yeah. Yeah, let's do this. It might be a good time for other people to go make a sandwich. But I'm going to finish the story. <laughs> In 1940, this gets back to this idea that they were running out of things to talk. They were running out of things to write about, right? They, right. They, and they hadn't invented supervillains yet, and so they were trying to figure out what to do with Superman. So Siegel wrote a, a story in which Superman encountered some weird metal from the planet Krypton. It wasn't called Kryptonite. It was just they didn't know what it was called. He didn't have a name for it, and it made him weak. So that's that's the precursor to Kryptonite. It's not okay. Kryptonite yet. But more interestingly about that story is that in that story also, Lois Lane learns that Superman is Clark Kent, and and it's permanent at that point. It's like the, it's clear from that story. Now this this strip has changed. Now they will become partners in crime. There we go. That's a huge big thing. Yeah. And so DC looked at this story. Management looked at the story and said, "No, you're <laughs> you're don't wreck the. I mean, we oh, don't right. we don't know exactly what's making this work. Right. So don't wreck." So, yeah, yeah, so, so don't break it. Don't break it, exactly. Okay. And so that story went in the drawer, and it wasn't found again until 1988 when I found it personally. What? When I was on staff at DC Comics. Yes! And I was in the library mulling around, and, and I found this big box of Jerry Siegel Sitting scripts. in your happy place, essentially. Really, you know, my, absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes, when I die, that's where I'm going. It's the DC library. Exactly. Um, I found this big, giant box of, of old carbon copies of Jerry Siegel scripts from the okay. like, 1930s, 1940s. And I was fascinated by this. Nobody had ever looked in this box before. Right. And so I started going through the scripts and matching them up to printed stories. Right. And I found the one script that didn't match anywhere. And I started looking through it and I realized we've seen pages of this thing. It, it was all drawn. Okay. We've seen pages of this thing over the years here and there, but nobody had ever seen the whole story together and knew what, right. you know, knew how, how explosive the story would have been to the mythos and how it would have changed everything. Yeah. So I dug it out. And we, I brought it to DC. I brought it to my bosses at DC. I said, "We got to publish this. We got to find some way to publish this somehow." And right. let's find an artist. And all we got to do is get Jerry Siegel to sign off on it because he, you know, he's on decent terms with DC at that point because DC right. had in 1975, DC had settled with him and Joe, Joe Schuster and finally given them a pension and given them their credits back and so forth. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't the happiest story because they still didn't get a giant amount of money, but they got right. a decent amount of money. Um, so Siegel was in, in decent. You know, in decent terms with DC, but he was very volatile, always very volatile. Right. Uh, I read his autobiography once, and oh my god! And nobody's read his autobiography because it's not been published. <laughs> oh really? Yes. It's it's like a hundred pages, single space pages of like this angry screed. He wrote it in like the <gasps> early seventies when he wanted Superman back, and he he felt he, he was bitter and angry, attacked, and not and... not unjustifiably, but still, right. the whole thing it reads like a it reads like a it's just. It just rage on the yeah, page. There, yeah. It doesn't even make any sense. He's just giving his autobiography and talking about his whole life story and all of his, his, his stuff. But everything is just this bitterness, this huge bitterness is hanging over it. Wow. Um, so he was a volatile guy. So we, so we went to, you know, we went to Jerry Siegel and said, hey, listen, we want to publish this. Is that okay? And he's like, no. Nope. Great. All right. Well, can't force it. Nope. So no one's ever seen the story. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, there's always a part of me that's like. Because, you know, never say no without a number. 
Yeah. You don't just say no. Yeah. You say, you ask for the number that's ridiculous. That's just it. And then they say, well, we don't have that money. They would have paid it then. They and they would have paid, paid they it. They would have paid it. It was the 50th anniversary of Superman. They were doing all kind of stuff. This would have yeah. been the perfect capstone to that. So that said, I'm trying to remember how we got off onto this curve, but we were talking about kryptonite we're talking about oh, right no because oh, superman so so okay so it was so, not called kryptonite not called kryptonite and it and it never appeared in the comics so uh 1942 1943 superman's also on the radio mm-hmm. doing a 15 minute a day advent serial adventure story on the, okay. on the radio um and the guy who plays superman wanted a vacation yeah but he can't take he's the star of the show and it's a daily show <laughs> So what do we do? So they invented something called kryptonite to make him weak so they could have a, a, a long continuity of him just kind of lying in a corner by, oh. with criminals having captured him and held, yeah, holding yeah. him captive. And he's groaning and moaning. Well, you can get anybody for that. Yeah. You know, so he can go, you know, Bud Collier, you kid. get to go take a few weeks off in the Caribbean or whatever. There you go. And so that's that's where kryptonite was invented to give the guy who did the radio show a vacation. Oh, that's perfect. But then it became that's such a, a really good plot device that. Who was the guy who played the, the radio guy? Bud Collier. Okay. My ad, my ad, my ad. I'm about to do an ad. Hey, guys. It's Simple Contacts. Remember them? They're the most convenient way to get your contact lens prescription renewed and stock up on your brand of contacts. Instead of taking time off and spending hours at the doctor just to renew your prescription, you can now do it online in under five minutes. By the way, this is not a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. You still need to do that. But it is the most convenient way to renew a prescription and reorder your contacts. So check out Simple Contacts and get $20 off. You just go to simplecontacts.com slash dorkforest20. Here's how it works. You take a quick self-guided vision test from your phone or computer. It's reviewed by a licensed doctor in 24 hours. And if your vision hasn't changed, you receive a renewed prescription and reorder your brand of contacts. It's simple. You can skip the office visit, but not the care. So if you have an unexpired prescription, you can use that too. Just upload a photo of it on your doctor's info on the app and order your lenses in minutes for a great price. They do all the hard work for you. Buying more contacts has never been easier. And why should it be hard in the first place? The prescription is $20. Uh, Shipping is free. Best of all, listeners get $20 off their first Simple Contacts order. You just go to simplecontacts.com slash dorkforest20 or you can just enter dorkforest20 at checkout. Do it. Let's get back into the show. And um, isn't there something where everybody who played Superman had some horrible accident? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, is it something that's not real? I don't think that's really real. It's a, it's, it's, it sounds cool to say, oh, it's a Superman curse. All the bad. But, you know, right. Dean, Dean, oh, the worst thing that happened to Dean Cain is that he worked for Fox News. That's the worst, <laughs> you know. So it's... Exactly. It's, you know, if you... you yeah. It, it's the same thing when you say, oh, it's... You know, deaths always come in threes in Hollywood. Right. Well, yeah, they do if you look hard enough. Well, sure. <laughs> exactly. There's always going to be a third. <laughs> it's that sense you're looking for a pattern that doesn't exist. Right. Fair enough. Uh, it makes uh, per- perfect sense. Yeah. I did like Lois and Clark. That was yeah. a, that was a, I thought that was a really great show. That was a really smart take on the mythos. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that one worked. Yeah. Matter of fact, is that on Netflix? Uh, I, I don't. I know again. it's streaming somewhere, but I don't remember where. Might be Hulu. Okay. Anyway, I've got them all, yeah. uh, and yeah. rabbit ears. Yes. So it's probably playing on MeTV <laughs> right, right now. Yeah. Um, so okay, so we're at like 1950. We're, we're at like actually 1966. Right. At this point, yeah. But this, at, by that time, the the whole idea of let's expand the mythos, let's expand the mythos. Uh, there's only so far you can expand it before right. it just be- starts to collapse under its own weight and just becomes <laughs> right. silly. And yes. now he's coming up with superpowers that are ridiculous. He has and, a dog. And he's got a dog with heat vision and a cat. Super, his cousin Supergirl has a cat with heat vision and she's fallen in love with a superpowered horse. Right. And all that sounds funny now. But in context, it's very charming. Remember, this was for children. Right. This was for children. So it's easy to look back. And I, I do it, too. I mean, it's easy for me to make fun of it, too. Right. You but can easy, riff. You know, riff and look back on that stuff and, and how absurd that was. But it's for kids. Yeah. And it's, let them like it. Yeah. And here's the thing. Uh, they could put them all together like the Pet Avengers. Yeah. And then yeah, they, they could have perfectly the, good uh, adventures, which I thoroughly enjoy the Pet Avengers. They, in fact, have the, uh, oh, have they? the, the Legion of Super Pets. Oh, it the was, Legion of it Super was Pets? Comet the Super Horse. It was Crypto the Super Dog. <laughs> it was Streaky the Super Cat. And it was Beppo the Super Monkey who came from Krypton. Oh, fair enough. Yes. And oh, wow. wow. They're all, are they all super, they're Superman all super, They're all Superman relations? Related, but okay. Except for the horse. The horse 
is a magic horse. Didn't come from Krypton. Okay. But still wears the Superman shield around his neck and stuff. Right, so, yeah. right. Good wants to fit red, red cape. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. It's part of a family. Yeah. So, um, and so the legions of su- the Legion the of Super, Super Pets. Pets. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm, yeah. Well, I wish to read the legions of Super There's Pets just, as well. If you, if you go with it with that sort of open-eyed, you know, open-hearted, realizing this is just charming stuff for kids – then it's pretty cool to read. If you, yes. if you have any cynicism to you, then it's not going to be fun to read, and it's going to be you just right, be, don't read that. But read, in, read but a different comic. Right, book. Exactly. So it's <laughs> e- my feeling. It's easy to make fun of that stuff. Yeah. It's it's but it's not rewarding. It's, right. It's I, rewarding I to actually go look. If you if you were a kid, if you like it, it's rewarding to go back and look at it and go, oh, this is something that's kind of whimsical and funny. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I think in in all of the different comics, there's always a. Um, there's there's always a great couple of pages, yeah. right? And yeah. e- even if I don't like the whole thing, there's gonna be something. There's gonna be something there that I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm glad I read that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a and I and I like pets. I like a teen superhero. There you go. I like a variety of things that um, and and if it's powerful and yeah. sad, yeah. I usually don't want to start it, but I'm glad that I did yeah. in the end because I it changed my life in some other way. You so. can, and you can even in those whimsical children's stories, you can tell stuff with some power. You can tell stuff with some impact, yeah. with some emotional impact. There was, oh, for sure. There was, I'll tell you my favorite Superman story. Yeah. Uh, there's I have two favorite Superman stories, but this is my favorite one when I read as I read as a kid. And this is going to sound ridiculous as I synopsize it. Okay. Because again, it's for children. <laughs> It's and 90, you were a child at the time? I was a child. Okay, so how old were you? I was, when I first read the story, like eight, nine years old. Okay. So it's a story called, this is 1962, it's a story called Superman Owes a Billion Dollars. Ooh. And the, the conceit of the story is this, and again, we can make fun of this all we want, and it is goofy, and it is ridiculous, and it is completely implausible, but within the context of the Superman world... It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Okay. So, so an, an, a well-meaning IRS agent... Sure. Realizes that Superman has never paid income tax. Now, he doesn't have a job per se. Right. But he still arranges for donations to charities. He still does all kinds of charities. He does this and that and so forth. He Reward money comes in and he donates it to hospitals or whatever. That's still taxable income. <laughs> so the guy go, does the runs, the numbers and stuff. And he realizes, wow. okay, Superman, you owe a billion dollars to the IRS. Oh, my God. And instead of incinerating with heat, him with heat vision, Superman <laughs> says, all right, well – because this is again, these are Superman is an authority figure to children. He's going to play by like the, by the right. rules, and so he's okay. Well, I got to come up with a billion dollars. What do right. I do? But Superman doesn't charge for his services because that's just wrong. Right. So then the entire rest of the story is a comedy of errors, in which he finds some ancient Atlantean statue that's going to be priceless, except that the Atlanteans catch up with him and go, "Oh, you found that thing. That's so awesome. Thank you for finding that thing right. for us." Or <laughs> here is he finds a bunch of discarded ivory tusks. Uh, that you know didn't take right. them. He didn't. He wasn't the poacher. I'm saying he found. He found a bunch of discarded right, right. ivory tusks. Like okay, these are worth money. And then uh, and then uh, Bizarro, the strange alternate version of Superman, the strange backward version of Superman, shows right. up and uses a ray and turns the ivory bars into ivory soap. And so they are useless. So <laughs> it's it's this after this after this. And right. So you get to the end of the story, and uh, Superman shows up and he says, "Well, you know what? I I blew. I got. I missed the deadline. I couldn't do it." Right. And then, do I have to go to jail? What do I do now? And that's when the IRS guy's boss comes in the door mm-hmm. and says, let me explain something oh, <laughs> to, right. his, to his underling. He says, if you're going to be a stickler of the rules, if that's right. what you're all about the rules, then what you have to also bear in mind is that under the United States tax code, and this is the early 60s, right. um, everyone is due a $600 deduction for every deductible, every every. You know, every de- oh, you know, every right, deduction right. they can take, every de- a, every dependent. That's right? where I went. Every six hundred, you know, six hundred dollars for every dependent. Well, the whole world depends on Superman. The oh whole my world God. depends on Superman. I'm so getting any- a little choked up. Exactly, yeah. exactly. This is my point. And so even and so, if anything, we owe him money. So yeah. So that again, silly, 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 silly. And then that moment of heart of yeah, the whole world depends on Superman. Yeah, it was really gripped me as a kid, and that that's that's why I love Superman right there. Yeah. That is, yeah. 
Th- that's awesome. So now the, my next question yeah. is Bizarro Superman. Oh, when was, where did that come from? <laughs> that came from it was it came from the newspaper strip for a while, and then it graduated into the comics. And it was a guy named Al, an all writer named Alvin Schwartz. To give credit where credit is due, came up with the idea. The idea is that some well-meaning inventor tries to create a duplicating race. He can make food for everybody, or you know, oh. gold that we can you know do right, whatever. Right. Um, and of course, it doesn't work. It actually creates an imperfect duplicate uh-huh. uh, and of Superman that is craggy looking and white skin with chalky faces. Right. And it looks kind of like Superman, but has all the same powers, but is backward and everything he does is the opposite. Okay. Everything he does, if you say fly up, he flies down. If he says, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to leave now, it means he's going to stay. It's just, it's <laughs> ridiculous backward language. Okay. Um, and that was a really popular character for a long time. He had his own strip. Right. Well, because uh, didn't he at one point, wasn't he evil? Yeah, but he was never, well, he was never really like maliciously evil. Okay. He was always just sort of. He was just kind of weirdly backwards. Weirdly backwards. Yeah. You know, okay. just, he's, he's always, a decent, there's a decent heart in there. Right, right, right. But, he, but he's doing evil things. Is there an evil Superman? There, there have been a few evil Superman over the years, yeah. Okay. But there's, I mean, nobody with that same, same level of power. Okay, so but, it's not Superman with a mustache. Right, exactly. Uh, okay. there's no, yeah, there's no, I mean, I'm sure there have been alternate universe stories Super- of one-offs here or there and stuff where we've seen evil Superman. Yeah. Right, okay. But nobody who's like a regular recurring villain in this trip. Okay, yeah. fair enough. And then um, what about the Phantom Zone? Like, the first two Superman movies are my favorite. Yeah. And... Um, and I think I only own the third one. Okay. Weird. Very weird. That's very odd. Okay. That, I don't know why that We have happened. to get you up. Yeah, okay. exactly. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> because I think I think the Christopher Reeve 1979 one is actually on Netflix right now. So I, think it's I have yeah. watched it uh, yeah. a couple of times. Yeah. It's You can download it and yeah. just have it on your phone. Yeah. But um, As I do. As, as you would. Right. Yes. <laughs> as you should. Yeah. What, uh, what is – are those three characters from the books? The, the Phantom Zone girls. Yeah. The kind of uh, General Zod's from the comics, okay. uh, but Ursa and Non, who were his, or not from the comics, but okay. they were later brought into the comics. Um, this, uh, there was a weird codicil in the uh, Mario Puzo was the writer who first wrote the, the first Superman movie script. Okay, The Godfather, that guy, yeah, that guy, yes. Oh God, and he All did right. he did first draft, second draft, third draft, but it wasn't until they brought other writers on to as, as Hollywood does right. to turn it into something. Um, but it was something weird in Puzo's contract where things that were in the movie were not automatically owned by DC Comics for use in other media. Oh, wow. So That is a very powerful deal maker, whoever it's, made that I know. deal. Because yeah. so, so, you would think if you were the comics, you would want the comics to sort of transform to look like, to mirror what you're seeing on the screen in this movie. Right, big, but, to but, sell some more comics. Right, they couldn't do that. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, wow. So, okay, so just Zod. Right. And Zod was from Krypton. Right. And, and, and that makes sense that his sort of sidekicks were just in there. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And, um, and the Phantom Zone was not from the movies. The Phantom Zone was from the comics. And it okay. was, again, this idea that Jor-El, Superman's father, had created this way of imprisoning the worst villains by putting them in this sort of formless void. Right. Rather than killing them. Right, right. And then the irony is, that, of course, they all survive the destruction of Krypton because they're in the Phantom Zone. Right. They get out. Right. So they eventually and, get out. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, I saw the first season and a half of Supergirl and yeah. don't know why I stopped watching it. Don't know it. why you stopped. Yeah, because it's... Is it still on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So... Uh, I loved it. Yeah. Um, her boss was my favorite. Yeah. Calissa uh, Flockhart. Calissa playing. Flockhart. Yeah. 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 And um, uh, I can't remember anyone's name. So that's yeah. why I'll yeah. be referring to people by their characters' names. Gotcha. And uh, these are actual humans. Uh, yeah. Rangers know that. So, uh, but Calissa Flockhart was was the my favorite character. The, the woman who plays Supergirl. She's great. She's great. Yes. She has this great heart to her. Yeah. That is, that, that comes through. Earnestness. Again, yeah. that's the key, the, that the key element of all superhero, if you're playing them on the screen, is some sort of earnestness. Right. Yes. Right. Which is weird because the, the guy who played uh, The Flash yeah. and then now plays Captain America. Right. Um, or Human Torch in Captain America. That guy, or, Chris yeah. Evans. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. Yeah. Human Torch. Yeah. Uh, Johnny Storm. Yeah. yeah. And, um, it was he. He found the right level of earnestness yes. for Captain America for yeah. some reason. Yeah. It was because it, it didn't work entirely for Johnny Storm. No, but for, for for Cap, it's like the best casting since Christopher Reeve. Right. Yeah. He really is. Yeah. Yes. 
Agree. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, but Supergirl, that was a, that was clearly a comic that, uh, and you wrote some Supergirl yeah. too, didn't you? Yeah. I've written and why wouldn't you? Have? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were there. Yeah. And so, um, I don't, I don't know that I've read the Supergirl, uh, your, your Supergirl stuff, but, um, and can be corrected. So, um, where are they now in the, in the, cause there's so, there's so many, why isn't there a Superman TV show? Because Warner Brothers wanted to save him for the, the movies. big, okay, and they they worked out the people who did the Supergirl TV show worked out some exemptions to the rule where they could get a actor to play a Superman for a couple of a couple of episodes here or there, but the blanket rule up to up to recently, and I don't know whether it's still in fact. And mm-hmm. the point was, no, we are saving Superman for the movie. That's why Batman doesn't have his own TV show. That's why Superman doesn't have his own. TV. That's why Wonder Woman doesn't. We we're saving them for the movies. Okay, yeah. fair enough. And um, but all their DC TV stuff seems to be excellent from that's, from what I've heard. That's the that's the isn't that interesting that the that. Marvel has cracked the movies, right? But their television shows are not great, right? It's hit and miss. It's hit, it's and, hit miss. and miss. Yeah. Whereas, whereas DC can't crack the movie, except for Wonder Woman, they can't crack the movies, and right? Then, but man, their TV shows are awesome, yeah. right? Everybody is on board yeah. with, and I don't. There's, I don't watch enough television, yeah. So literally. Uh, I, I and there's no way to catch up at this point. I, <laughs> no, I, no, I know. I, I, I keep waiting for that magical week of my life where I'm going to be in bed with the flu for something. Right. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Right. It turns out I also have the flu. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm yes. going to sleep. But I, I like the only thing I watch um, is Agents of Shield, yeah. and then Peggy Carter, and then um, and now Cloak and Dagger. Okay. So yeah. it's it's I saw the first season of Daredevil. And D'Onofrio scared the shit out of me. D'Onofrio was great in that role. He was amazing. Yeah. And I can't possibly watch anymore. Yeah. Uh, I got to sleep at night. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Yeah. Um, because I, I, I've been reading Daredevil forever, but mm. it's not um, – and not forever. I've, I've only been reading the comics since uh, 2003. I okay. read Spider-Man right. when I was in junior high. Okay. And then – I went away. What brought you back? Uh, Andy Ashcraft, my mm-hmm. partner in crime mm-hmm. uh, here in our home, mm-hmm. uh, is always been a comic book fan. Okay. And so I went with him, and he mostly read the superhero stuff. Right. And I would weed off and go, well, what is this weird? So what was the first thing you picked up after, after junior high that was like, I, this is my reintroduction into this world? Well, he handed me a stack of top ten Okay. Which yeah, is by Alan Moore. Alan Moore, yeah. uh, where there's a dog. It's Hill Street Blues, but it's... <laughs> Hill Street Blues with <laughs> aliens and super and science animals, and stuff. And it's animals. amazing yeah, 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 and yeah. hilarious. Yeah. And then uh, and then I think it was Sandman. Yeah. And then, of but, course. San- the gateway drug to all... Right. Yeah, and, yeah. and then Lucifer. Right, yes. And then, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. then... Um, and I think I liked Lucifer better than Sandman okay. initially, and then I went back and finished Sandman, yeah. and I liked it, and because I didn't get it, I it, it takes a second to. Yeah. It, it's sort of like my nephew gave me some manga, mm-hmm. and it's a learn skill to learn how to read manga, right? Yes, and uh, and the same with comic books coming in. This is what I keep trying to tell people who are in comics that keep are all upset that the whole world doesn't read comic books. Okay, <laughs> comics are like. Any other foreign language, if you learn it when you're a kid, yeah. you're proficient in it. But I teach at universities. I talk to adults everywhere about learn, seeing comics for the first time. And adults want to know, well, how do I – do I read this this way? Do I read it across the spread or do I read it up and down or how do I read the comic? They don't even right. understand that, which we take utterly for granted. Right. But we shouldn't. This, it is a language. Right. And – and he's been reading them since he was so little and yeah. never stopped. Right. That he looks at the whole page. Yeah, yeah. And he sort of absorbs it all. Yeah. And he'll see things in the background of panels yeah. because he went to he actually went to college to uh, for art. Okay. To draw comics. Okay. And then realized when he graduated from college that everyone who was an artist had been drawing the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. he was like, that, I don't yeah. think I want to be an artist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what he had been doing was gaming. And okay. so he's a game designer. Right. Okay. So, uh, but, so he fell into that, but yeah. he's always loved him. And so he sees, th- like, he's like, are you reading? Did you see that thing in yeah, the background? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And I was like, no, no, I did oh, not. Because okay. I tend to read the words. It's nice that you have a guided tour. You it, so you got a, a, oh, my God. The yeah. native Sherpa yeah, is that, yes. very important. Yeah, yeah. I refer to him as uh, my long box. That's a dick joke. Yeah, okay. that's a, that's but a bon. hilarious okay. dick joke. Anyway, so, but he has, um, yeah, so I think, who's the guy who wrote Howard the Duck? 
Steve Gerber. Okay. He also wrote, it was a short, it didn't end right, right. because they cut him off, yeah. but it was about a Columbine kid. Oh, it, yeah. High, what? it was a high school. Yeah. And I'm blanking on what the name of that was. It was a DC comic. For it was a were, DC yeah, comic it was, and it was fascinating. Yeah. And I just picked it up and I was like, well, what is this? And he was like, I don't know, but it's the guy who wrote Howard the Duck. I'll yeah. read it. And yeah. so we, and so I would end up finding sort of the, I, I've, let, led us in weird directions that he wouldn't have yeah. gone to. Well, that's cool. I mean, that's yeah. the, the other thing that people don't seem to realize is that uh, comic books is not superheroes. Comic books is a medium. And you can it, tell whatever kind of story you want to tell with comic books. When I, st- when I started looking at them, I was like, it's like stand-up comedy. Right. It can be about anything. It can be about anything, exactly. By anyone, yep. for anyone, exactly. which is delightful yep. if you are someone that isn't a straight white guy. Right. Because yes. then you're psyched. Yes. You're like, oh, my God. <laughs> Someplace I might be able to see myself. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's just, it, it's, yeah. And so it's, it's he, he gave me the three fingers, you know, yeah. the, the Mickey Mouse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that one? I think so, yeah. Like, he, he thought that I wanted to only read weird one-offs oh, okay. at a certain point. So yeah. he started trying to find me. And I was like, well, what's, yeah. I don't know, what's Captain America doing? Yeah. And. And I didn't know what Captain America was yeah. because I just saw a guy with a flag. Yeah. And I was like, well, that guy's probably an asshole. Right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and then you read him and you're like, oh, no. No. No, he believes in the ideals exactly. and the dream. Not the process. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's, not, he's not supporting those that are using it for their own good, no. for their own advancement. So it's, uh, it's one of the greatest things about comic. And I um, – I, I've written this comic book, and I worked with a, a, a Dark Horse uh, editor guy, yeah. and the process was fascinating, yeah. to because I had never written a script of that sort, right. and um, and so it's whether it gets made or not is is what did you find to be the biggest challenges? Uh, I didn't tell him that it was at night. That was the first little, big challenge. Little, yeah, little things like that. Yeah, important. Okay, yeah, yeah. The woman drawing it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she was going to want to put some nighttime in there. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, I think because I, what, what I did was I took one of my longer jokes, mm-hmm. like a story time, a storytelling right. kind of bit, and turned it into this script, mm-hmm. and it allowed it to flesh it out. Yeah. And what I'm used to in stand-up is tightening, mm-hmm. and I'm not used to being allowed to come up with right. a lot of details and a lot of angles and right. a lot of subtlety. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was that was the yeah. most interesting thing for it. And when you're writing a script, you're the cinematographer, you're the writer, you're the director, you're you're all of these things. You have to bear all this stuff in mind as you're writing the script. Right. You have to remember to tell them things like it's night, right? Or and here's you know here's what's happening in the background, or here's you know people compare it to storyboarding. Yeah, I mean, I, it, but it it doesn't seem like I don't know a lot about storyboarding. It's like storyboarding, except you have except you're using words instead of pictures, which is infinitely more complicated. You're having to spend fifty words to explain what you're looking at whereas right. in a drawing you can do it boom 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 yeah right so like if you draw the storyboard it sh- it goes with the script yeah. but the script when it when you're doing it to send it to the artist yeah. is more complicated is more complicated and more it, complete it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, it's 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 even more complicated than a tv script or, or a movie script because you're also including you're calling every shot Right. So you're currently, what books are you writing right now? Okay, so there's several. There's several. Right now, I'm actually, at this moment, I've decided to take a little bit of time just to relax a little bit, so I'm only doing like three or four. Oh. <laughs> um, but right now, I'm doing, I'm doing Doctor Strange at Marvel. That's right. Uh, which is great. I mean, yeah. it's great fun to do. Uh, we had run out of characters for me to do. Really, really we'd sat around and gone, okay, well, I'm, gonna, I'm coming off of Captain America for the fourth time. Right. What do I want to do? Well, I, I've done every other Marvel character. Well, Doctor Strange. I haven't done Doctor Strange. Let's do Doctor Strange for year that's right uh so there's that uh i'm also still doing some archie comic stuff uh here and there uh i read the archie zombie yeah uh one not mine but still, right which yeah. one did you i see i was doing the, the, the mainstream straight up okay this is but they they came to me this is four or five years ago they said we want to reinvent the whole look of this thing we don't want it to be you know jokey jokey joke you want it to be a little funny with some layers but yeah. some layers and, and maybe a little more you know a little more sort of teenage oriented yeah and i said you know i'm 53 years old right and they said right. no you know we think you can do this <laughs> and so it wasn't as much of a challenge as i thought it was going to be because you know getting in the heads of teenagers it's it's impossible if you're going to just try to Snapchat your way through it. Oh, I'm right. going to throw the word Instagram in and hope it'll you know right. hope, hope it'll age well. No, this thing is, don't that crap doesn't age well. Right, slang doesn't age well. This is why Daniel Waters when he did um, Heather's right invented every bit of slang in that movie. 
Oh. Every word of slang in that movie, every expression is invented by him because he wanted specifically to make sure that it never dated. Okay. So nobody says, gag me with a spoon. Nobody says, you know. Oh, right. You know, to talk to the, to the hand max or, or whatever. whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with Archie, I did the same thing. I'm trying to come up with my own stuff and, and remembering what it was like to be a teenager because – Yes, my high school experience is different than a 30-year-old's high school experience was. It's different than a current high school's vastly different experience. But there are certain things that are universal, right? Everybody remembers the first kiss. Right. Everybody remembers the first time they screw up in front of the whole class. Everybody remembers the big moments. It's all high opera. Right. When you're a teenager, everything is high <laughs> opera all the time. <laughs> right. So you remember that, then I can then I can write Archie comics. Yeah. So that, that became a lot of fun. And it yeah, gave yeah. a place to do stuff that isn't superheroes, that had heart and humor to it. Right. And so uh, – like I think I'm, I, I think I'm slightly behind. Yeah. Wait, you finished Daredevil? I finished Daredevil. I finished. Okay. Uh, I finished. Yeah, everything. I'm looking at your list upside down. I seem to have finished all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do. I just did an Ant Man story for about five issues. Did five issues of Ant Man. Oh, was I had fun. That, that yeah. was a lot of fun. Yeah. I've been wanting to do a microscopic character for a while because I'm a physics geek. Okay. I, I minored in physics in college, and so okay. this is my my big passion is, is so it's fun to do. I mean, it's comic book science. You still have to every once in a while if it comes down to. Drama versus hyper accuracy, you're going to have to come down on the side of drama. Right. But try to make it as realistic as you can. Right, right. And try to, or try to invent new physics. Yes. Which you can do with the magic of a pen. With the magic of a pen. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, uh, I have a friend who teaches physics, yeah. uh, AP physics. Okay. Uh, I asked, I famously, in my mind anyway, asked her, so have we. Literally, and I was dead serious. I asked her, so have we figured out a way to control gravity? And she was like, wow, uh, no, no, not at this time. Not, not at this yeah, time. Yeah, we're uh, a couple of centuries behind that at least. Yeah. The journey continues. Yes. And, uh, but my math and, and science skills are very basic, so uh, it's, I, I can make change. So that's pretty, much, that's, that's pretty much the hit list right now. So those are the three you're working on right, right now. Right now. And then there's other stuff that I'm working on that hasn't been announced yet, but there's sure. – you know, there, but I'm – I also do a lot of creator own stuff. I like to do the stuff that's my own. Yeah. I like to do through Marvel or DC that I can just publish on my own. Is and that is Kingdom my stuff. Come too? Uh, no, that wasn't. But irrede- oh. but actually, Irredeemable and Incorruptible were also we're not. They were, I own a piece of them. They're not oh, fully fair creator enough. own. Um, Empire is something I did with an artist named Barry Kitson. That was basically what happens when the villains win. Okay. Um, the whole concept is is the most powerful man in the world, the greatest supervillain. He wins, but our story starts like the next day. Ah. What happens when you've won? Well. You, the idea was he had a 10 year plan. Yeah. And seven years in, he knew two things. One is that he was going to win. Right. And the other one was he didn't want the job anymore. Because <laughs> once, you're, once you're king of the world, and this sounds like comedy, but we play it as Shakespearean tragedy. Yeah. Once you're king of the world, all it means is everybody is gunning for you. Everyone's gunning for you, and you still have to get. The, the water to work. Yes, yeah, you have to get trains on time. So, yeah. that, so that's Empire. So that's oh, that's, that's new, awesome. Thank you. So yeah. That, uh, there's a bunch of other little stuff I've done over here and there that I still want to get back to. So yeah. right. Okay. Uh, that is neat. And then, yeah. uh, by the way, everyone, it's Mark Wade. That's who I'm talking to. It's at Mark Wade. Yeah. W a i d. And is there a Mark Wade dot com? There is a Mark dot com. Okay. So, but uh, Twitter is mostly true. And, although I don't, I don't hang on Twitter so much these days. It's 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 a toxic. It's it's pr- uh, oh right right it's a bit of a cesspool right oh, now. Oh, it's right. So, oh, a bit of a cesspool is a yeah. quite a quite an understatement. Yes, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, The great thing about doing stand up comedy yeah. is that I don't have any problem blocking hecklers. Yeah. Like it's my comedy club. Right. I'm like, oh, well, you don't have to like me. Turns yeah. out, knock yourself exactly. out. Exactly. Uh, go forth. And if and if I always think if if hecklers or or trolls think that they've won that I've blocked them, yeah. then we both win. Exactly. I hope it all works out for them. It all, it, <laughs> I, I I tend to favor muting other than other than blocking. Right. With muting, they still get to scream into the void, thinking that they're being heard. And well, they're not. And they might get something out of that. They're, they're in the Phantom Zone at that point. Right, That's exactly. You yes. put them in the Phantom Zone. Yes. Okay, before we go, and yes. we're close, but I want uh, I want to hear what your second favorite, because you told the first one as a kid that you read, The Superman there is a, a Billion a, Dollars. There's a prose novel. The prose novel was written in 1979 by a guy named Elliot Magan, huh. who's my favorite Superman writer. Okay. Um, How do you spell Magan? M-A-G-G-I-N. I am. Okay. And uh, he wrote a... a Superman novel called Last Son of Krypton, original story. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry, I, he wrote, and then he wrote a second one that's my, the one of my favorite is Miracle Monday. It's, it's a second sequel called okay. Miracle Monday. Um, that's a great story. It is basically Superman versus the devil. It doesn't, he's not, he's, he's not really called the devil, but okay. he's, he's Satan. He's sure. Superman versus, and, and so the ultimate Superman story, how do you defeat mm-hmm. 
Um, and in it, there is uh, – you know, I'm, I'm, I know I'm running over time. Uh, oh, that's okay. We didn't get – we didn't talk about Luther. Right. And, and we haven't talked about Brainiac. Right. So the short version of Luther is uh, Luther grew up in Smallville – along with Clark Kent, and mm-hmm. was a disturbed kid. Like a really, like a, a, the kind of Stephen Hawking genius that only comes along once in a generation, but emotionally disturbed. Emotionally okay. disturbed. And the Superboy does something accidental, thoughtlessly, right. and destroys his experiments, destroys his lab, destroys everything that young Lex has built. Ah. And so Lex, that's the final piece that snaps Lex. And like he just becomes focused on, I hate Superman for the rest of my life. I will do everything I can to destroy Superman because he destroyed me. Right. Which is, again... A very oversimplified way of looking at the world, but again. But if he's psychotic. He's psych- but he's psychotic, exactly. <laughs> right. But there is a part of Superman that always knows if I had just done things, if I had just thought for one second before I did this thing. Right. I could have, it's not, it's not exactly my fault. Right. I did what I thought was best at the time, but if I'd just done it differently, if i thought, taken one more second to really scope out the situation before I, I did this thing, then Lex wouldn't have snapped. Right. And I have cost the world... So of, much. Uh, so much. Mm-hmm. And that is Superman's cross to bear. And so there's a part of him that misses the Lex that he knew because he also the, – the kid was brilliant. The kid was the Superman's uh, – you know, Superman's super smart. Yeah. Lex is a genius. Yep. The two of them as, as kids, they, they were friends because yeah. they were the only two people in this little tiny town in Kansas right. who could see beyond you know the horizon. Yeah. Um, so there's a scene – there's a time traveler in the story. Superman wins. Time traveler – you know, sits down with Superman and and Superman says, "Listen, um, can you tell me one thing." And Time Travel says, "I can't. I can't. I really can't. <laughs> can't tell you about the future." I said, "Well, just I have one, tell you. What, I'll ask one question. Ask me one question." And so Superman says, he thinks about it. and He says, "Will Lex and I ever be friends again?" Yeah. And, and the you know the time traveler pauses and says, "Someday." Okay. And that was, that was, that's, that's my that is my favorite Superman moment. Yeah, because it's not about punching stuff, right? It's about that's how vulnerable are you at that moment to be like that? Just that's all I want to know is can I have my friend back someday? Wow, yeah, that's amazing. Because I genuinely thought you were going to say that he goes back in time and corrects that error, no, but and then we see what Lex Luthor because, and this is cynical, yeah, because because my thing is is that when you make when you make an error when you're a child like yeah. that, it's um. You may, you may have you've you've sent Lex Luthor on a different trajectory. Right. If he's psychotic, something else sends him on that right. trajectory. Whether it's an unforced error or a forced error, it's right. still going to happen. But if you're but if you're Superman, right, you take the weight of the world. You on take you. the world on you exactly, yes. and you don't necessarily. He doesn't necessarily. He doesn't go through his life thinking it's my fault. Right. But he does go through his sane. life thinking. Yes. Maybe. Right. What if, if I had done something different, would it have made things different? Right. Yeah. That's fascinating. Okay. Um. So, wow. Okay. So, look at, and look at what you've learned today. Look, I've learned so much, <laughs> and it's uh, and because Lex Luthor, there was a there was a uh, a point where Lex Luthor was president. I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And how, how would we ever? Uh, there was, uh, man, I remember when we did that story. This is like 1996. Yeah. We elected Lex Luthor president <laughs> of the United States, and everyone in the DC universe was like. This is ridiculous. We would never elect a corrupt <laughs> businessman with a with psychotic right. edge to the, the highest office in the nation. This and is then absurd. And then we all did. of a sudden, yes, it's uh, we're telling the future, future telling yeah. the future. But I, the weird thing is, is that uh, I do think that there's a lot. There's so much. You were saying that there. You know that Superman isn't real, right? I know that the Lord of the Rings isn't real, right? And right. I know. That right. Harry Potter isn't real. Right. But I have a, a genuine belief mm-hmm. that people who write things like Superman yeah. and write things that affect at such a visceral level yeah. that that world exists. Yeah, there's something real to it. Absolutely exists. Yeah. Yes. I, there's part of me that – and this uh, – I'm going to sound like a crazy person, huh. but that there's a parallel – that there is parallel universes. where Because I don't necessarily think we're that smart. No. That it's the bleeding through yeah. and the stories of these things that, that create these heroes. That could be. Is uh, is something that actually gives me some sort of solace. It because gives, It gives me some place to go on vacation. Right. And the end of Irredeemable. Yes. Yes. Kind of does. Kind that. of circles around to that. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So it's kind of fascinating, too. Thank you. Uh, the, 
Oh my God, we're exactly at an hour. Okay. Um, Mark Wade, this has, of course, been a delight. Well, my pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, being on the show. Anytime. And uh, everyone, go find. Uh, there's thousands of things that you could read. That there's, Mark I've Wade. literally written two thousand things. There's, there's. That's it's not an exaggeration. It's two thousand things. You yeah. can find something. Knock yourself out, yeah. you guys. And uh, so, thank you so much for doing the my show. My pleasure. And Rangers, you know the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh, my God. Thank we you. Why don't we just call that as the end of the show?